My name is uh, Bia Labachi. I am a PhD in anthropology, and I am an adjunct uh, faculty here in the East-West Psychology um, Department program in CIIS, and I'm also the executive director of the Chikruna Institute for Psychedelic Plant Medicines. And this is our uh, Women in Psychedelics Forum. I just want to start by um, giving a big shout out and thanks for everybody that have helped us to bring this together. So this, is, this event is a co-production between Chikruna and uh, the East-West Department uh, of here from CIAS. And we counted with the support of three esteemed uh, allies and friends um, and donors, which were MAPS, the WVC Women's Visionary Council, and Compassion for Addiction. Many thanks. Can you please clap for them? particularly proud and happy to have the support of the WVC. I'm 47 years old. Uh, when I was a small baby, these ladies were already doing the counterculture uh, here in the Bay Area. So we're, we're happy to follow on their pioneering work and to have them as a co-sponsor of our event. Uh, I just want to say a few words because the program is pretty packed. Um, so I'll just go right to it. Um, this is a forum that unites um, 15 women from different backgrounds and disciplines and places of speech. Uh, so we have on the one side social scientists that do work about the role uh, of women or other topics in the field of uh, psychedelic science. We also have some um, people that come from underground psychedelic communities. We have drug policy activists and we have uh, experts on women's spirituality. So if you name something women and psychedelics, what are you trying to cover exactly? And this is a bit an attempt to map uh, a kind of road or uh, framework to address this topic. There are multiple things and there are multiple entrances. We kind of didn't have exactly one topic that we wanted to address, but we thought of a series of people uh, and perspectives that were dear to us. and kind of built it that way from the bottom up, seeing what people were interested in talking about and then trying to create dots and connections between uh, those perspectives. Uh, it's important to note that perhaps one of the more important aspects of these discussions of uh, women and drugs is absolutely excluded from here, which is the topic of how the drug war affect women uh, in different communities throughout the globe. The women are particularly vulnerable to the drug war and there's a high level of women incarcerated, particularly indigenous women in places uh, like Mexico, for example, for their role in uh, participating in, 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 the, in the drug war machine, so to speak, as uh, people are trying to sometimes make a living or don't have a lot of opportunities. So this whole impact of the drug war is something that we're not addressing here. This is not because it's not important, but it's because we had to select a few things to address only. So what are we addressing? We're, we're addressing the gendered spiritualities and ways of healing. So uh, what are women's contributions to this whole idea of healing with psychedelics? Uh, we are trying to give, um, to give more visibility to the historical and contemporary role of women in the field of psychedelic science because these voices have been uh, frequently misrepresented or underrepresented. They have done a lot of things that not necessarily appear in the history books and continue to be misrepresented. So it's an attempt to bring visibility to all of this. And we also want to uh, have a kind of intersectional perspective where we're thinking about the intersections between gender, race, and class. And we are also addressing another you know, uh, hub of controversies and delicate topics that have to do with sex, seduction, and safety in the field of psychedelic science, in psychedelic communities, in uh, plant medicine, underground circles, and so forth. And we're also wanting to address the problem to try to think how uh, nonprofits and NGOs structure their boards and the, the, the role of philanthropists in this field and how does the fact that there are so uh, fewer women on positions of power in these structures affects the production of knowledge and affects uh, what is being created 
uh, in this field. And I just want to say that, uh, you know, I'm a Brazilian that immigrated to the U.S. recently. And um, not to say that Brazil is a great place, much, 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 much now with the president we elected, but uh, to me has been a kind of initiatic journey to learn this anger that exists in this country. And I want to say that we want to, you know, address these controversial topics, but we want to speak from a place of compassion and a place of love and not just anger. And this forum is very much built under this idea. And we also don't want to alienate men. We consider men allies. And so it is a forum by women and women voices, but we're trying, trying to aim to create positive outcomes, connections, love, and community. Thank you so much for being here. I'm going to pass the word to my colleague, Emily Sinclair, from the Chikruna Institute, and also a fellow anthropologist, coming all the way from the UK. Hello, um, I'm Emily. Uh, as Bia said, I'm an anthropologist as well. And I conducted my research in the Iquitos region of Peru. Um, and I was living there over the past three years. And I'm here at this event, especially to launch an initiative that I've been working on with Bia and Shakruna over the past few months. And that is an initiative on sexual abuse in the ayahuasca community. So today we're launching um, the Ayahuasca Community Guide to Preventing Sexual Abuse. And that is available through our website at shakuna.net under the community section. So please take a look at that. Um, we'd really like your feedback. The whole process has been collaborative and we'd like to continue to do collaborative work going forward on this issue. Um, so just to tell you a little bit about Shakuna as a whole. Um, for me, working with Shakuna has provided me with the wonderful opportunity to put my research in the field into practice and to work on an issue, and I'm sure issues in the future, that I think are really important um, and to hopefully have a positive impact on, in the field on those issues. And I think that's a big part of what Shakuna are really about. Um, we're a group of researchers and also plant medicine enthusiasts, and we've all had years of experience that is personal as well as academic with plant medicines in different regions and with working with different cultures. And the main focus of our work is to create a bridge between the ceremonial use of sacred plant medicines and psychedelic science. So that means ensuring that sacred plants are respected not just as psychedelic medicines, but also as an integral part of our cultural identity and as ways of exploring our very humanity, what it is to be human, really. Um, so we provide public education, creating understanding about cultural practices with psychedelic plant medicines and also the cultures surrounding them. And we aim to protect sacred plants and cultures as these medicines go global and are integrated into our legal, social, and healthcare systems. We also advocate for the legalization of sacred plant medicines and for safe practices with these medicines. Currently, we have five programs. So the first is the production of original academic research. The second is articles that make this research accessible and prevent different perspectives from the field of plant medicines and psychedelic science. Another of our programs is the Council for the Protection of Sacred Plants, who will be working towards legalization of sacred plants. And the other is the Women, Gender Diversity and Sexual Minorities Group, which promotes the voices of women and queer people in the field of psychedelic science. And our other program, which I'm a part of, is the Ayahuasca Community Committee. We set up the Ayahuasca Community Committee in the interest of supporting the Ayahuasca community and serving the Ayahuasca community. So we want all our projects to be community guided and community led and community engaged throughout. So our first initiative is this Ayahuasca Community Guide to Preventing Sexual Abuse. And we're hoping to actually do further research on this topic. 
Um, so we'd love your ideas about moving forward with the project as well. Um, so far, the process has been totally collaborative. It's been really interesting. Um, we, we sought the feedback from indigenous women and South American women, as well as Western women, and also men in our field. And I'd like to emphasize that I think it's really important that we include men in this discussion as well. Um, I think that's integral to making progress on this issue. Um, so please send any feedback to emily.shakruna at gmail.com. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, so, hello? Is that working? Okay, yeah. great. So, my name is Sarah. I work for um, the MAPS Public Benefit Corporation and the MDMA Therapy Training Program. And a little over 10 days ago, was on a webinar that BIA organized with my colleague Shannon Claire Carlin, who's the director of the training program. And we were talking, focusing on ethics in, the, in MDMA assisted psychotherapy, in particular on the ethics of touch and clarity around sexual boundaries. And so, Bia asked us to um, come here and read a statement on behalf of the organization, and so I'm filling in for colleagues with um, with that intention and in solidarity with these many efforts. Thank you. Um, I'm also an alum of East West Psychology, so it's really great to be back here. Um, okay, let's see. The MAPS Public Benefit Corporation, uh, aka I'll refer to it as MAPS BBC, catalyzes healing and well-being through psychedelic drug development and therapist training programs. MAPS PVC is a wholly owned subsidiary of the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, a 501c3 nonprofit. MAPS PVC was founded in 2014 to balance income from the legal sale of MDMA and therapist trainings with the social benefits of MAPS missions. The team at MAPS PVC, largely led by clinical women researchers, women clinical researchers, is currently engaging in a multi level review of the subject of ethics, considering the ethics of the therapeutic relationship as well as institutional ethics as a for profit entity within the psychedelic therapy movement. Public benefit corporations are companies that are obligated to balance profit and public benefit and commit to social responsibility, transparency, and legal accountability. Certified B Corps are evaluated against an ethics scorecard, and MAPS PBC is the second pharmaceutical public benefit corporation to form that we are aware of, and an industry ethics scorecard for pharmaceutical public benefit corporations has yet to be created. The MAPS Public Benefit Corporation has been working with ethics experts and the B Corp certifying body to develop such a scorecard by which MAPS BBC and others can be evaluated. Ethical assessment of public benefit includes measures of respect for persons, radical transparency, justice and fairness, and democratic deliberation. We look forward to finalizing the scorecard as a measure for assessing our organization's ethical performance. In addition to organizational assessment, the ethical guidelines for practitioners training with MAPS to offer MDMA-assisted psychotherapy is of major importance. The MDMA therapy training program is currently drafting a code of ethics for MDMA therapy providers and has begun to develop structures to enforce the code, such as a complaint process for patients and evaluation of therapists. Given that this modality often involves deep trauma and attachment work, and on top of that, non-ordinary states of consciousness, MDMA-assisted psychotherapy carries immense healing potential and along with it, additional ethical considerations. The potential for greater suggestibility, um, issues of consent, the potential of stronger and more complicated transference and countertransference, and risks of re-traumatization, to name a few. Given the special considerations of this modality, as a psychedelic organization and training program, we take seriously our ethical obligation for safety. While this code of ethics is tailored for MDMA therapy providers working legally under a MAPS protocol, we at MAPS PBC see this as one contribution tailored to this modality within broader collaborative efforts to articulate guiding values and measures of safety within the overlapping worlds of psychedelic psychotherapy, ceremonial practice, and self-experimentation. In particular, we wish to acknowledge and appreciate the work being done, including by many people in this room, to address issues of sexual abuse and gender-related oppression in psychedelic spaces by shifting responsibility for safety away from potential victims of sexual violence and carefully listening to the stories of survivors, allowing these stories to, to inform the development of ethical care in all settings. 
To come back to the work um, at MPBC, trust is a cornerstone of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. Trust within the therapeutic relationship is essential and can support participants and patients in reconnecting with the felt sense of trust in themselves and others and in, and in life. As practitioners, we might support this kind of relational repattering by assuming a temporary role as an attachment figure or responsibility that requires us to be trustworthy, to use the power we have as professionals and servants to participants being guided by their own autonomy. In order to maintain integrity in this delicate work, we see an ethical commitment for therapy providers to hold clear professional boundaries, to engage in ongoing self-reflection, and to re receive feedback from supervisors and peers, and to offer feedback when it might be needed. With that said, in MAPS protocols and within the training program, we place a special emphasis on the ethical use of touch, since touch has both the power to heal as well as the power to harm. The safe and therapeutic use of touch requires careful attention to agreements between therapists and participants and to ongoing communication about its meaning and effects. While this code of ethics is still in draft form and will be a living document, I'll read a small section from the current draft focused on ethical touch and clear, sexu clear sexual boundaries. When working with touch, we discussed consent for touch during intake, detailing the purpose of therapeutic touch, how and when touch might be used and where on the body, the potential risks and benefits of therapeutic touch, and that there will be no sexual touch. We obtain consent for touch prior to the participant or patient ingesting medicine, as well as in the therapeutic moment. Aside from protecting a person's body from imminent harm, such as catching them from falling, the use of touch is always optional according to the consent of the participant or patient in addition to clinical judgment. We discuss simple and specific words and gestures the participant or patient is willing to use to communicate about touch during therapy sessions, such as using the word stop or the hand gesture to stop and touch will stop, or holding a hand out in the air as a request for touch to hold hands. We practice discernment with touch, carefully consider where they're touching a participant or patient is appropriate. We assess our own motivation and use clinical judgment before touching a participant or patient. We do not initiate, respond to, or allow any sexual touch with participants or patients. We agree that sexual intercourse, sexual contact, or sexual intimacy with a participant or patient, their spouse or partner, or their immediately family member during the therapeutic relationship or during the two years following the termination of the therapeutic relationship, which by the way is an industry standard, is unethical for all therapy providers. We respect the sexual identities and expression of our participants and patients while maintaining the responsibility to uphold clear professional boundaries. We commit to examining our own sexual countertransference, to not acting upon this transference in ways that create ambiguity or confusion about sexual boundaries or are otherwise unethical, and to seeking supervision and receiving counsel from colleagues as needed. And lastly, we aim to uphold clear sexual boundaries and ethics in the non-therapeutic relationships of our day-to-day -day life. I um, just want to present that this process has been informed by so many different ethical codes and other perspectives, and if you're interested in this subject of ethics and psychedelic psychotherapy, I really recommend the book The Ethics of Caring by Kylia Taylor, which focuses in depth on ethical issues that can arise specifically when working um, therapeutically with non-ordinary states of consciousness. Um, a quote from Kylia, the deeper a client moves into a state of consciousness which has an inner transpersonal focus, the greater need for a professional's adherence to the ordinary ethical issues and the greater need for professional self-reflection, supervision, and an ethic of care. So to conclude, sorry. <laughs> Um, as we continue to learn collectively through this work and through listening to other stories about the impact of trauma, our hope is that this growing awareness can help us also see and transform the ways that we as individuals and organizations might knowingly or unknowingly cause harm or curtail the freedom of others. With that said, we at MAPS BBC believe that we need to receive feedback to promote ethical growth, we want to welcome that feedback from this community, and appreciate the opportunity to learn from the many voices gathered at this space. Good afternoon, everyone. 
Um, can you hear me in the, thanks, you can make it a little bit higher, thanks. Can you hear me in the back, back corners there? I hope so. Um, well, welcome. Thank you so much, Bia, for organizing this. She's one of the great organizers, you know, and to CIAS for sponsoring it. And uh, thank you all for coming. And um, if you came from outside the region, welcome to, you know, the California dream. Hope you have your mask on. <laughs> And um, I do want to acknowledge, as I always do, that we are on the land of Native people who've been here for many thousands of years, uh, Olone and their different branches. And, um, and it's an honor to be on this peninsula between the Great Bay and the Great Ocean and to be talking about um, such an important issue. And uh, we are in a state, our state is in a state of crisis, as you know right now, and uh, with all sorts of ominous signs for crises in the future. And, um, and I, I just want to acknowledge the grounded reality that we're in right here because I do think that as, uh, as investigators, as people who are interested in psychedelics, take psychedelics, and I'm gonna speak today as though we all do, I will assume that we have um, that in common, uh, that that looking at this situation that we're in is part of the the job, part of the role that we have as psychedelic people, and as um, in my view at least as um, hopefully healers of the culture and healers of the of the people and our and our challenges and our differences. Um, so Bia said I could introduce myself. So I'm Kathleen Harrison. I have a master's in uh, health, arts, and sciences, and I have been a practicing ethnobotanist for many decades now, and I co-founded and run the nonprofit Botanical Dimensions. We have a table over there with a lot of um, literature about our events on it. It's situated up in uh, Sonoma County, um, but people come from all over to our events in our library, and I hope that you'll check out the information about that and uh, I teach classes and others do as well, and we have special events and membership for a very special ethnobotanical library. Um, so I have to make fun of myself a bit. I also sometimes make fun of Bia, pardon me if I do. Uh, <laughs> and um, uh, one of the things that I've been sort of like hugging on myself today is that I just chose such a huge topic, feminism, the feminine, and psychedelics, the past 50 years. I mean, <laughs> but you know, I don't get an opportunity to talk to a crowd that's interested in women and psychedelics very often, and, um, and I feel that each time I have gotten that kind of opportunity, because there have been gatherings for the last uh, 20 years. Uh, let's see, I think that uh, Susan Seitz and I produced the first Women in Psychedelics conference that I know of in 96, I believe, and then Women's Visionary Congress formed and, and produced a number of them. But each has had a very different flavor and focus. And, um, and the time we are in history and where these uh, plants, fungi, chemicals, and the society that's holding them, that keeps changing. That changes from one, you know, decade to the next significantly. And I, and I thought, well, of course, it's only 40 minutes, so that's not very much time. But uh, I tend to teach all day classes, I'll just warn you. Um, <laughs> um, but the, uh, the, I have the privilege of having witnessed this story for five decades. And I just want to say something about the patterns that I've seen both form and dissolve in that time and where it seems like we are in that ongoing fluctuation. It is not a direct progression. It is not a complete failure, although there have been collapses of different sorts in this time. And, um, and so I'm a, I'm a pattern thinker and a pattern seeker. And I, and I feel that psychedelics, that that's one of the best things they do. So that's really what I want to talk about, are the patterns of 
of awakening and forgetting and invisibility and structures that are bigger and older than this psychedelic society, if we can call it that, that are also very persistent. And they have to do with all the isms that we know trouble us so much, sexism and racism and classism and, and, um, and all the ways that we as humans, especially humans in a country such as America, um, that we restrict ourselves and or that we are restricted. We haven't shaken those off. So I'm going to try to touch on those and give you food for thought. And the way I speak is unscripted and um, a little free form. So I hope you can uh, just ponder these things along with me here. Of course, we have the terms. So we have feminism. And we know that feminism historically really began back in the 1840s. And the first wave of feminism was very much tied to um, the abolitionists and to wanting to, women wanting to help people who were being treated. Um, at that point, they were still slaves, in fact, many people, but also urban, the urban poor, all the people who were um, people of color or people of poverty, uh, people from Eastern European nations or other nations that were coming into the United States, whoever was at the bottom of the totem pole, the bottom of the barrel. And I am sorry if I use some old terms. And I, I'm just, I'm a little nervous because everybody, because, you know, we're in the lovely call out era now where like, I just feel like, oh, I'm too old to be in that. I have had too much exposure. I can't like analyze everything I say before I say it, but I'm trying to. So please, yeah, make a joke about me. How about that? <laughs> um, so, okay. Uh, but that feminism, that what I see as the feminine was engaged in society in this country trying to recognize and reveal to those in power that those without power were being brutalized in all of these ways that were not humane and not necessary and that those changes could be brought about in our society, but women needed more of a voice to do that. And so it became also the beginning of the suffrage movement. And that went on, you know, until 1920. We haven't been voting for 100 years yet, women. You know, we have not been voting for even 100 years. That's a minute. I've been alive for 70. My mother was the only, all the other women in my family remembered when they couldn't vote and remembered when they got the right to vote, and what a big deal that was when I was growing up. And, and so it's just seconds, you know, seconds really in the big long story. Um, and, then, and then we, you know, I'm not going to tell all of like 20th century history here, but, um, but different things came about in uh, the 1930s, and as many of us know, uh, a number of, of Drugs were made illegal. Cannabis was taken off the medicine list and put into the uh, illegal list for racist reasons for a number of number of them, but also economic and um, power, the root of so many rules, and uh, and puritanism of different sorts and all of that, and and uh, it was illegal until 1938 to even prescribe birth control. Uh, for women, which all we had were plants and devices that we invented. But even to talk about it or distribute them for free, you could be imprisoned and were. Many women were imprisoned for sharing information about birth control. And, and I say that because these stories carry on together. Suffrage, feminism, birth control, and eventually psychedelics. They're actually tied through the 20th and into the early 20th, 21st century. And, and so, of course, you know, huge fluctuations in the economy and the 30s and the 40s and the wars and, the, and, and, all of, and then the, the tightening down with that lean, clean and shiny white dream in the 1950s of how if we all just conformed and wore the right clothes and lived in the right size boxes, then we could be productive and everything would be functional, you know. And... Uh, as soon as you set up a tight system, of course, you get people rubbing elbows and getting restless. So, uh, so people did. But 
what came together in the 1960s that was that w that I I think it's worth trying to parse is that we had in the background LSD had been invented and was simmering along in the hands of just a few people and not quite yet released into the into the uh, populace and we had birth control pills had been worked on through the 1950s and were not released into the population until I think it was 1961 and that took a while to move around abortion was very illegal and um, JFK was uh, assassinated in uh, 1963 and um, that was the great shattering for my generation, for a couple of generations, of, uh, oh, the world is not what you make it and the world is not what it seems to be. The world has all kinds of hidden agendas in it and it has brutality of a sort we hadn't anticipated and you can't believe what you see. I, I think many people my age uh, look at that moment as the end of childhood for, um, for our generation, which was a, the baby boomers, a very big generation. And, and so w there were things like shaking the, what we thought of as normality. And, and these wove together into um, a really rich mix birth control being available at the time that LSD came onto the scene allowed us women to make choices that we hadn't been able to make before. And that was the birth of free love. And that's become a cartoon like so many things about early psychedelia have. But it wasn't really. It was really a, a, a release, an unbridling of all of these rules. And if you had you know, if you were sensual or sexual, you were liable to get pregnant and ruin your life, so to speak, or be sent away. I mean, we all knew girls who were just disappeared all of a sudden and didn't finish school and had babies and the babies were sent away and they, you know, everything like rearranged and they tried to keep the lid on it so life was normal. But here we have people who are discovering the world is not what it seems to be. We have, um, we have tools to be more free. We have uh, a desire to explore, and now we have LSD as well. And so once that really came in, we got this combination of all of these things that made that first wave of the psychedelic revolution. And I, I'm trying to tell this from a female who lived through it from my point of view. So I first encountered psychedelics personally when I was you know, 18, 1966, and um, you know, perfectly placed in the Bay Area for the summer of love and all of that. But I didn't really take the giant, uh, just disassemble reality into a zillion pieces and watch it fragment into diamonds all over, all over the world and beyond and not know what's connected to what and fall, dissolve, fall to pieces, and have everything else fall to pieces, all meaning fall to pieces. I didn't have that great Gnostic undoing kind of experience until 1968. And then I did, and I had it because, contrary to a lot of modern habits, I took a huge dose, and I took it without, without anybody helping me, and I just made myself available for complete dissolution without any idea if I would reconvene as a human being, you know? And I am still really an advocate for that kind of experience. And, and I, I know that not everybody can do it, and I know that I even had friends who probably had, you know, they had incipient cracks of some sort. And those cracks became larger, and then they had to deal with that. And sometimes that was rather disastrous, and sometimes it was a big improvement, you know? But... Um, <laughs> But for those of us who dove accidentally or intentionally into the deep end of the pool at that time, we saw what happens when you actually permanently separate your vision of what is real from what society advocates every single day, where actually you create questions under it all. 
where you look at the deep structure of your worldview and of your society's worldview on a communal level, on a philosophical level, on a, on a linguistic level, why is it the way it is? Does it have to be the way it is? What is actually real? Is magic possible? What is magic? What is revolution when you're actually thinking of turning over a society and creating a society that actually works better, that takes care of people better, that's truly communal? And many of us tried that then. Of course, we fell in love with nature. That was the back to nature movement, back to the land movement. Many people moved into communal living situations to try to create a modicum of this new model they'd seen. Other things arose, the arts and music and all the community that came out of music particularly, you know, and that, that continues. Um, all of our desires to, to eat real food, to grow our own food, to have our babies naturally, to um, take care of our dying, to uh, raise our kids with our own values, to really be soul partners with our lovers, you know, to really have a different view of what relationship could be. And so it was a very idealistic time, but not to make it all sound too much like the myth of, you know, flowers and rainbows, it was also we're at war in Vietnam. That was one of the threads that was going along through this whole thing. We were losing our brothers and our classmates, um, leaving high school and going off and not coming back at all or coming back maimed or unable to speak or all of the different things that happened from that. We were in the streets by 1968, 69, same time, you know, uh, tear gas and fighting the war and fighting the, the uh, rules that were coming down and the society was so polarized. To, even to me now, it's kind of amazing to remember, and I lived in Berkeley and went through all that stuff, you know, I didn't want to miss anything. And, um, but it's kind of amazing to me that people uh, managed to take psychedelics and go to uh, 10,000 person um, protests and uh, live in, you know, underground groups where they were printing pamphlets and have babies and do all these things all at the same time. Really, we were like living multiple lives at the same time. But what we were trying to do, and I'm generalizing a lot, but but I was, and I think many people were, um, we were trying to refigure how society could be. It was for the good of the whole, for the good of the giant collective that we are, for the good of the species, for the good of all beings. We, we found that feminine quality of compassion and of holding and of the recognition, what needs to be tended here? Who is not being tended? What needs to be mended here? What has been torn in society that we've gotten used to and we think it's just how it needs to be? Who is in charge and do they, is that, do we always have to have a power structure like this? And of course, why are most of them white men? I mean, we had to ask that. And these things have not changed very much. So many of us my age, and I think there are a few of you here, have expressed to each other, um, not so much to younger people, because you know everybody's hopeful that they can make a difference, but huge disappointment, huge disappointment that our visions which we tried to carry out with our life choices and with our work in many cases, and many of us are still doing the work that we chose then, decades down the line, that we have, of course, everything fluctuates. Fluctuation is part of how life works, of evolution, of, of just reality, you know? It's part of the yin and the yang, which is the feminine and the masculine as well. It's the balance that wobbles and rebalances and wobbles. We know that, but we are in a really low rut right now, <laughs> and it's not looking good for less suffering for the future. It's looking like a lot more suffering of different sorts for all beings. So where does, not just, I'm not trying to just tell you because of nostalgia, I'm trying to tell you because I think there is actually a deeper collective vision that is very much a feminine vision. The feminine in each of us, and this isn't female and male, I should have said at the beginning perhaps, but 
you know, we're all made up of the feminine and masculine, every single one of us, wherever your incarnation chooses to be or move on that scale from male to female, we're each making, having impulses and making choices and making alliances every day that match up with different parts of our feminine and masculine attributes. And, and we're like snowflakes, no one's the same, we're all unique in our in our way of manifesting those impulses. But thinking about what is feminine, what is what actually constitutes the feminine and the feminine uh, what the archetype, what the feminine archetype is and how we manifest it in our understanding, in our worldview, in um, our impulses and the choices that we make and what we do in the world. Um, I think that is so hard to see. Maybe we're not used to thinking that way exactly because we're polarized more by external. Um, but in this very polarized time, I think looking at certain levels of awareness and choice and action within each of us and thinking about what is feminine and what is masculine and how those dance together and how they have to dance together. I think that's really possibly valuable. So I would say that psychedelics, and now, you know, if you know my work at all, you know that I've done a lot of work, field work with people in other cultures way back in the 70s and the, and the 90s in the Amazon with ayahuasca for the last 25 years in Mexico with my extended Mazatec family and, and mushrooms and, um, you know, West Coast subculture for 50 years now, um, and all the other, uh, and, I, and as you can tell, I still pay homage to LSD as well, which I think is kind of like the godfather, so to speak. Uh, <laughs> that was probably not the best word, but uh <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but in that it, it like created a house that we all stepped into, and then we realized, oh, there's so much more here, you know, there's just so much more here, let's look at that. So... Anyway, I have um, the uh, I have the sense that the psychedelics themselves, all the forms they take in the plants and the fungi and the laboratories, are feminine. It's a, it's it arises from a deep need of the earth, of life, of life itself to know itself. There's they're just these beautiful, exquisite precious tools that we little humans have been able to receive and and that's been happening for a long time in some cultures and they've developed ways of relating to them and employing them giving them and receiving them knowing how to contain them knowing how to expand them all of those things that are really for the whole for the big picture one of the ways I feel that we could be evolving I would say maybe should be evolving is we've been in an era for quite a long time now I don't know maybe 20 25 years or something where the psychedelic experience is mostly focused on as a way to investigate yourself to find out where you're hurting and what was hidden to you and what you need to fix and that is really important because all of us are wounded to some degree and many of us are very much so and so I really respect that and I think it's definitely a you know crucial part of being on the psychedelic path but if you look at other cultures and how they use psychedelics and ayahuasca and peyote and the mushrooms and iboga in Africa and you know the various other ways that people have of going through an ordeal, the typical form, go through an ordeal to reach an altered state, to have a totally different view, to emerge as a new person. If you look at that, then the goal of that is to come out and be someone who can add to caring for the community. And the community is as large as you designate it to be. It's, as, it's all of us now because it's a tiny planet getting less habitable all the time with more people on it all the time. That's the community, right? And the community is all the other species as well. So I feel like one of the things that 
we could cycle around to again is back to that earlier vision of how do we take care of the whole? What is reality? What is the structure of reality? What is my worldview? Each of us asking ourselves that. What is a worldview? What is my worldview? And what is the worldview of the culture, the one that we feel trapped in right now? Which is why we have so much conflict and shortage and uh, uh, misunderstanding and language that doesn't meet our needs. It feels like the feminine has not been heard really for a long time. And I don't just mean women, women too, but the feminine voice in all of us and this feminine quality of tending and mending and nourishing and growing and holding the potential so that we can be whatever really marvelous thing we can be together. One of the great gifts I found of LSD, and I know I'm sounding terribly nostalgic, but that's okay, um, because I, I have you know fallen in love deeply with each one of these medicines for an era of my life or for different reasons. Um, but one of the great gifts of it, I think, is, is that uh, it actually allows the, the seeker to, to see the invisible structure that is holding things up. It gives us a kind of x-ray vision. I used to say it just lets you see the bones, you know, the deep bones of whatever it is we are living in and what we assume is given and that is part of reality. And once you see it, you know it's a choice. And it's a collective choice. And we don't have to make those choices this way. We can actually make them differently. And no matter how many of us take psychedelics, we're still going to be just a small part of the overall society. But that's OK. A lot of small parts make resonant changes that filter upwards, that, that you know have waves of influence. Partly, we have influence because um, we have other generations coming along to take care of, and they're going to have to take care of this beleaguered planet. You know, these little, these little children right now, whether they're your children or grandchildren or your students or your neighbors or the kids in the park, you know, they're all the ones that are gonna have to do this. And so there are ways we could try, speaking of that structure and of the sexism and racism and all of the terrible things in that power structure that exists, still that's largely white, largely male, although a little less so, thankfully, this month in this country. <laughs> and, uh, but largely oriented to keeping power at the top and keeping benefit for the few people who have the power at the top. That's basically our system, right? That is not a collective caring system. And so how could that be done differently? And can we use these visionary states with the intention of really looking at those structures to see how they could change. And one of the ways they have to change, one of the fundamental ways, is we really have to look at, at what is hidden in each one of us that we haven't looked at yet. And if you've taken you know, a psychedelic trip that's in this bandwidth up here, but you haven't looked there and there and there and there, then you haven't seen how you're replicating the dominator system. And unfortunately, men are very much, I mean, I think men are programmed to replicate that system. So you have to actually either have different parenting and rearing, which we could try to do from now on, and have the ability to disassemble something that's been implanted in you by cultural programming because you've looked really honestly at it. And I think that even, you know, one of our early disappointments, my generation back in the, in the 70s, was once we, you know, got the word feminism, women's lib, as we called it really, usually women's liberation and women's lib, um, which was very liberating, was wonderful just to have words and to get together. And it was also scary, you know? I mean, a lot of us were like, we're just like girls who like to trip. Now we have to be like women who are getting liberated and being activists and everything, you know? So, like, oh, it was, it was another grow-up moment, you know? But um, uh, but I remember among some of my friends that role of the 
the big psychedelic investigation of your assumptions. That, that was really important. And that we thought when we had that kind of connection with a partner, with a boyfriend, with a partner, with the person we just fell in love with, with a, a exploring relationships between women, all of those things that we were doing then, um, that we were speaking the same language when you get to that place. And I, I remember the heartbreak over the 70s and the 80s and the 90s as we each realized that no, the cultural programming was stronger than the deepest insight and that in fact we were relatively invisible still. I remember the moment on a psychedelic when I recognized that my, you know, supposedly famously conscious partner was unconscious, unaware of this whole realm of like really the worth of the female voice, the worth of the female contribution, the fact that women were holding the floor together, were actually holding it all together, you know, and allowing for this creative potential, this manifestation, which is much more vertical and showier than the horizontal and the, the vast earth-like nurturing, you know, and I'm, I'm generalizing, okay, but I remember recognizing like, oh, that, the earth is invisible, we're invisible, our voices are just whispers in the distance, the conversation is all between them, that's who rises, they step on each other's shoulders, they're stepping on our shoulders, and if you speak up too much, it's competition. So you can't be, you can be really smart, but you have to be quiet about it, you know, to keep your family together, to keep your job together, to keep your whatever it is, you know, because this is the structure. And, and I feel like psychedelics are actually potentially really helpful in busting us, you know, so each of us and us collectively so that we don't replicate these patterns. I don't think we need to continue to replicate them so much. I think that actually right now, even in the psychedelic, uh, I must use the word industry because it's starting to feel that way, you know, um, that we have to be really, really careful to look at these structures and how they're affecting us every day, whether they're giant nonprofit corporations or giant for-profit corporations or who gets the certificates and gets to give it and who gets to take it and how, how many hoops you have to go through. I mean, we have a very active and awkward model going on right now with the so-called legalization of cannabis. And I'm sure there are many opinions in this room, but in my view, again, I'm old school, okay? But I, I think it's a failure, you know? I think that it's just hyper-regulation and taxation and uh, exclusion and I'm, so disappointed in California for having done it this way. And I know over time, some of the fine grained, you know, a lot of it led by women, people in the cannabis world will rise up and there will be an equalizing of some sort. And, and I really, really look forward to that. But, um, but I think we have to be careful in the closely related and enmeshed psychedelic research world and the modification and the way we talk about it, the story, the narrative that we tell about psychedelia, an old word, but um, I think we have to be careful about the story we tell, that we have to tell the story too. The people who are peripheral in that story, the people who are female in the story, the people who are not PhDs and MDs, and the people who are doing the long-term folk science of growing and collecting and taking and telling each other about their experiences. That's the underground. And the underground is another entity that is feminine in its nature. It's feminine because it's horizontal, because it's like mycelium, it's network, it connects everything. There is no seat of power. There is no, uh, there's nothing that can take the whole thing down because it's like actually um, grown throughout the forest, you know, because, because the underground has 
And of course, there are many different things in the underground, and there are some terrible transactions and commodities. But when we're talking about, you know, what we used to call back in the 70s the good drugs, that meant cannabis and psychedelics, um, you know, that uh, when we're talking about the production and distribution of that, the underground is a very, very rich, nourishing, long term project. It's not going to go away because of pseudo-legalization or so-called real legalization of anything, because the underground holds a different kind of information, not just goods, but actual experience and information. It transmits differently. It generally transmits by the age-old oral tradition, because it's illegal. Therefore, by its nature, it's not you know recorded every inch of the way and published every inch of the way. So our ability to have experiences and talk about them and share the tale and share what we've learned. I don't just mean like trip tales, you know, that's a little goes a long way on that. But, um, <laughs> but I mean, what did you learn? That's always for me the question. What did you learn? And when you get together with your friends again and when women get together, I've been in a women's circle for 25 years. We just talk when we get together, share food and ask each other, what have you learned since the last time I saw you? And we mean, what did you learn right here? You know, really, what did you learn about living? And some of it comes from this. We have, we all share this in our background, but we're living our lives. We're saying goodbye to our loved ones as they disappear. We're doing all of these things and sharing what did we learn. That's what the, that's what this project is about. What are you learning here? What is the awareness that we can bring to this challenging future? And how does it come from these marvelous medicines that have been put into our hands. We are so lucky to have them. They are tools, but they're only as good as what you try to do with them. And if you don't know that you need to look into your foundation and see what your socially inbred assumptions are, then you're not going to see them. And you're going to be just like the other guys, you know, who are carrying on this model, this top-down model. The horizontal, long-living, hold the knowledge quietly, keep it spreading, keep it alive, raise the children well, take care of the elders, know what is out there to be gathered, gather it carefully, share what you have, meet adversity together, all of those kind of principles, you know, they all come, they, they come from being human and this human community, but also they come from the psychedelic experience. If you get your roots down and tap down into that juicy place where that information comes to you. So I'm really advocating, you know, somehow figure out how to really look there. And if that means a blow your socks off trip of some sort, you know, then figure out how to do that and know and go into it with the job, which is not once again to visit something that's been gnawing at you for years. And it's not just to have a marvelous time, although appreciating beauty and joy and all of that is part of the medicine we all need too. But it's really, you know, what is the work here? What is the reciprocity I can give to the beauty of this gift that has been given to me? The reciprocity is awareness. The reciprocity is using it to go as deep as you can go, to see what you can see, remember it well enough to come back, write it down, tell people, talk about it, and see what you can do to change your little part of the world that you're in. And look at that structure and don't assume that it has to be that way. We do have the power with our awareness to at least radiate, you know, life and impulse and love and um, ongoing awareness that can be passed on to the descendants, you know. We have that capacity. So I encourage you to look at these gifts in that way and to be careful as you go, but um, but dive deep. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you.